Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming, first off. Um, so today I'm going to be talking, uh, you know, a little bit kind of at the introductory level, but really emphasizing the intuition behind Pepsi. Um, so yeah, Pepsi, you know, we're going to take a kind of an agent-based approach to uh, starting to think about Pepsi. So we have Alice, and she's a proposer. And we also have another person, which is Bob. Um, Bob is a transaction originator. So he's a person that makes a transaction that uh, is going to try to enter a contract with Alice. So basically, they, they um, agree on, on this contract. And what the contract says is that Alice commits to including Bob's transaction in the next block she proposes. So that's uh, a commitment that she's making about uh, a particular property that her next block is going to have. And then at the same time, she also commits to including Bob's transaction as the first in the block. So we have here another property that she's committing to about this block. And kind of the idea here is to say that um, we can go really granular in terms of what we are committing to. So it's not just including the transaction, but also about the particular ordering of that transaction, uh, the particular place in the, in the block. And then we have that Bob, uh, Bob commits to paying Alice if and only if she does both things. So we have that uh, Bob um, sends the payment if Alice fulfills her whole side of the contract. Um, so now we have that some time goes by, and eventually we get to Alice's turn to propose a block. And what happens here is something really weird, which is that um, the, the transaction, sorry, the block includes Bob's transaction, but it does not include it as the, does not include the, the transaction as the first one in the block. And this is really interesting because we have that she basically, um, you know, fulfilled the first kind of uh, part of the commitment, but she failed to fulfill the second part. So we have here that the contract failed. So Alice basically didn't fully fulfill her side of the contract. And consequently, she doesn't get paid by Bob. But at the same time, the issue here is that that does not change the fact that she violated the contract. So in other words, we have that the payment didn't go through, but the block that violated the commitment still was made canonical. And this is really the core of Pepsi, that, for example, in the case where you want to have contracts with the proposer, um, and this proposer uh, is uh, defining a commitment about some block they're going to you know, propose in the future. Even if you uh, establish some form of punishment, you still have that a block that violated the commitment still was made canonical. And you may want to avoid that uh, in every situation. And at the same time, we have that these things are going to happen in the real world, because very often, due to MEV rewards, and you know, um, there may be more, uh, there may be a greater payoff from violating the commitment uh, than actually following through. If, okay, basically this is what I'm explaining now. So what just happened? And we have, yeah, that Alice violated the contract and we couldn't do anything about it. So we couldn't avoid Alice from uh, violating her contract. And the reason for this is that consensus neither enforced nor recognized the commitment that she had entered into. So in an ideal world, we would have had that um, the block was rejected, was rejected by uh, the network. So the block did not ever even become canonical. Um, and in this case, we have that that's not possible because the protocol does, is not even aware in the first place that these commitments existed. And so even if it can enforce something, it's not even, it's, it's not gonna enforce this. And so in this case, Alice has to be trusted to follow, uh, to follow through with her side. And she will not do so if the payoff from cheating is greater than uh, Bob's payment. And so the consequences uh, of that is that there are gonna be high contracting costs. What that means is that basically the costs from, in, from the, the contract are going to be higher, so parties are going to be less incentivized from entering into this contract in the first place because they only get so much utility, but if the costs are high due to these issues, then it just defeats the point. And so in this case, that happens because the contract fails to bind Alice to a particular course of action. So unlike with Bob, who can escrow the payment with a smart contract, in, this case, in the case of Alice, there's fundamental uncertainty about whether she's going to follow through or not. And so what do we do about this? So this is kind of the, the, the guiding question, right? What do we do about this? And one possibility is to base the chain's validity off the contract. 
So in other words, the block or the chain itself is not valid if it violates a commitment. And what this es essentially leads to is that commitments are not violated in the first place because the chain is going to keep on growing. We're going to have that if, for example, a block is invalid, it's just going to be ignored and at that slot uh, it will be as if no block had been proposed. And so this is kind of the gist of the idea, conditioning block validity. So Alice's commitment to a block must be consistent with Alice's existing commitments. So in other words, we have that she cannot commit to a block that violates a commitment she made. Or in other words, committing to the block is effectively inconsistent with uh, previous commitments that Alice uh, had entered into. And so what we can do is that we enforce this. And the alternative, which is you know, if we get an invalid, um, an invalid block, is that we just ignore it. And this effectively means that commitments, commitment invalid blocks are never even made canonical and they're not gossiped by honest nodes. So if I'm an, uh, an honest node and I receive a block I don't uh, and that block turns out to be invalid, I don't gossip it further. And so this effectively cuts um, the, the flow, uh, let's say, of invalid blocks uh, you know, at the early point of discovery that it was an invalid, an invalid uh, commitment invalid block. Um, before I talk about the general idea in more detail, do you guys have any questions? Okay, perfect. Um, so the general idea, so we have that Alice and Bob write, uh, write uh, commitments to the EVM. So the idea here is that we use the EVM as a source of truth, really in the sense that um, the commitment uh, is stored in the EVM and therefore we take it as, you know, as if it had become common knowledge. Um, and so they write to the EVM, to a smart contract at a standardized address, uh, which means that the same that they, the same place they write to is going to be the source from uh, the wider community due to this uh, kind of a standard that we're assuming. And so in this case, we have that Bob deposits payment amount with an escrow, uh, so that effectively uh, removes the counterparty risk for Alice. And then we also have to define a limit for the gas used to evaluate the commitment. Uh, the, basically. I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk more about this later. But the idea here is that you know uh, there can be a fundamental gas griefing vector if we allow commitments to be arbitrarily complex, because basically uh, third parties are going to evaluate this commitment, and the person that had made the commitment in the first place does not born does not bear uh, the computational cost that it causes on the wider community. Um, but anyway, so we have that after this, we wait for these uh, writing operations to become finalized. And, uh, you know, and at that point, we take it as the commitments having become common knowledge. And after that, we wait for Alice's turn to propose a block. And we have that Alice produces and gossips a signed beacon block. So I'm using a signed beacon block because that's the type of, the, of basically the type of gossip blocks in, in a certain consensus. So you know it's obviously uh, way more consistent, but also highlights the fact that she really does uh, make a commitment here. She does sign a block, uh, and then we have to validate it. And in that validation is when we not just check for the block being valid based on um, you know the default rules, but additionally we uh, check for the you know, for, for all the commitments that Alice uh, had entered uh, into. So here we have that recipients call a function in the EVM and pass the, signed, uh, pass the signed beacon block. And we have that the function terminates successfully if and only if signed beacon block satisfies the proposer's commitments. So in other words, we can define the commitment as a set of assertions that we're defining in some function in the EVM. And these uh, as assertions fail if, um, you know, the, the block violates uh, that particular uh, commitment. And we have here that if the function reverts, then the signed beacon block is rejected and not gossiped. Um, so this is kind of um, the most basic intuition around this. And so now I'm going to talk about implementations and a way of implementing this in Ethereum consensus with no changes to the protocol. Um, yeah. So I'm going to talk now about this idea, uh, protocol commitments with no changes to consensus. So in other words, Pepsi without requiring some kind of uh, hard fork or anything, just leveraging the existing infrastructure. So the, 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 the basis of this idea is that we use distributed validator technology to enforce uh, commitments on whatever thing that validator is signing. So 
basically we have that Alice, uh, you know, Alice's validator is controlled by an aggregate BLS key, um, and then this key is distributed using a uh, Shami uh, secret uh, sharing algorithm to basically a group of uh, external nodes. And these nodes, what they do is they only provide their signatures if and only if whatever thing they're providing their signature uh, for is consistent with the commitments of, of Alice. So we have here that Alice makes up half of the signature and the rest is controlled by a set of nodes and these nodes reach consensus about this. So nodes provide their necessary side of a signature if and only if the data in question is consistent with Alice's commitments. And so what we have, so basically um, we have here two cases that are possible from the end of the um, nodes that kind of uh, provide this service, which is that uh, the data that they have to sign is consistent with Alice's commitments. And in that case, uh, the nodes provide their signature and you know the signature necessary for consensus to recognize the validator is successfully produced. And we have that consensus effectively uh, recognizes the data and, and the, pro the rest of the protocol follows through normally. Um, so basically here we have that um, the protocol just recognizes the block and you know everything follows through normally. And then the second case is that the data is not consistent with Alice's commitments. And this is the, 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 the really tricky case, right? And this is kind of the, the, worst, the worst case scenario, sort of, uh, which is that, you know, um, you know, so in this case, the nodes do not provide their signature and the signature necessary for consensus to recognize the validator is not produced. And so what happens here is that consensus does not even recognize the signature and the protocol gracefully ignores the, the block. And so this is effectively uh, kind of leveraging uh, distributed validator technology in the sense that we kind of uh, build a threshold signature and you know, the threshold is only met if um, you know, the nodes agree that uh, the, the, the data in question uh, is consistent. Um, and then you know, here is a really interesting idea, which is commitment enforcement as a service, which is effectively what these nodes would be doing. So they would, you know, pro they're providing their signature um, it, if and only if. So basically, the, the, their signature is conditioned in a way that reflects uh, kind of commitment enforcement. And you know, uh, that also uh, means that nodes should probably be paid for their service. And you know, we, they can simultaneously not enforce a choice onto the, the validator because Alice, remember that controls half of the signature. So this is really important. And kind of what I mean here is that, yeah, you can make a service that is probably, you know, not exploitative of Alice in the sense that you know the notes are you know there's no easy way in which this thing kind of breaks down, um, and here is kind of an extra idea which is commitments for ERC four three three seven accounts, and basically you know here instead of uh, enforcing this using. Uh, threshold signatures, we have like simply a, a solidity contract. And in this contract, which is, you know, we have a function. So basically, in ERC4337, uh, there are signature aggregators, and these signature aggregators can implement uh, arbitrary logic. And so what they can do is they can implement the logic to screen user operations for, you know, them being uh, consistent with uh, commitments of the author of the operation. And basically, you can have like accounts in uh, account instruction uh, be only able to make um, basically to kind of uh, execute operations if and only if they're consistent with their commitments using just uh, the existing infrastructure. So it's a really neat way of implementing commitments for ERC for 337 accounts. And yeah, and that's about it, uh, guys. I uh, hope you liked it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to go over them. Uh, thanks. One kind of yeah. question, like in the situation where the, the block does not uh, satisfy the commitments, um, like is it like an alternative block proposed or just like an empty block or what happens? Yeah, so that would be an empty block. Yeah, because the proposer at that block is effectively already decided, and we simply have that at that slot. No block is recognized from that proposer, so the slot remains empty. I see. And like, what's the incentive for Alice to opt into the system? Is it, does she get like bribes from the? That's a great question. So it kind of uh, hints at the base of why do people choose to contract in the first place, and the reason is that sometimes there is more utility from future interactions from contracting uh, than there is from, say, uh, scamming the person in the short term. So that effectively means that there are contracts for which Alice has a greater incentive to follow through than not. And you know what we can just do is um, 
So, so one, one, one explanation for why people choose to contract is that uh, if you have a contract which is enforced by a third party, then you can use this to fix incentive incompatibility issues. And so the idea here is that, for example, um, you people can transact with or can enter into contracts with Alice, having certainty that Alice will follow through if the contract is enforced. And sometimes there's a really high utility uh, for doing that from the per perspective of Alice. Um, so I guess that's why. Um, yeah. Do you have to like, oh, sorry, I didn't map all the questions. Yeah, yeah no, but uh, <laughs> yeah, just one last question, I'll I guess. I'll talk to you later on about it, yeah. But uh, do you have any idea of what, what did you want to ask? Oh, basically, I was kind of curious also what the incentive of the other nodes who hold parts of Alice's uh, keys are to so like validate yeah. time. But I, I guess like if it's like rotating between them, then they have basically yeah, like there, there's some off, like off 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 like offline consensus or option consensus going on with some security something's happening there. Totally. So in that case, you would need to have some way of minimizing the principal agent problem, which is that you know the nodes act in the way they're expected to act uh, honestly. And so you can do that either by putting incentives or maybe even like a punishment scheme, uh, where you know you have that nodes have to report. And you know the ones that do, you know, uh, do not uh, align with the majority, uh, perhaps get uh, punished in some way. Uh, in a way, this is I feel like uh, the UMA B3 oracle a little bit. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. Do you have any questions? Okay. So, so Alice and Bob are able to write commitments about things that are outside of the EVM, and if they're in consensus as well. That's a great question. So, um, in this case. I'm using kind of uh, solidity. I'm, I'm defining, you know, commitments in the EVM because, uh, you know, I just, it's a great way of kind of uh, treating this as a common, uh, you know, like common software or like a common way of execution. So, um, you know, it's really easy for nodes or third parties to know what code to run in what way. Um, so, first question is, what are the limits of that? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to, um, but. I would say, you know, since the EVM is during complete, you can definitely do a lot of things. And then the other question is, you can only do as much, you know, so much uh, as you have, say, data in the kind of uh, in e the EVM. So, you know, there's a question of how, you know, the data availability question of, you know, you can perhaps only enforce co constraints or commitments on things that you can have the data for in the EVM for the program to be able to like run on uh, to, to enforce on. Uh, so. So to answer that, perhaps you know you can get a lot of data. I mean, uh, on the EVM. So uh, maybe the question is, how can you get reliably get data from the outside world to be able to enforce commitments on? Uh, and perhaps the, that it's an oracle. It's an oracle problem, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So one of the questions I was thinking was like, depending on the conditions that uh, that the contract sets. So like, um, as as Maz had asked, like. The boundary of the of the conditions can be, let's say, co uh, constrained within EVM. But then within EVM, like the the, the accessible range of data, for example. Oh uh, yeah. Right. It, it varies across the board. Yes. And also, as you mentioned, like there's the Oracle issues as well as like a gas limit, the, right? Gas limits and and so so like then that becomes another question, which is like, how much latency are we looking at depending on the types of contract that we enter? Like because I yeah. can imagine that some contract that we enter has like. A lot more latency constraints than others. Yeah. So, what would the sort of like the that, that kind of a comparison look like? Yeah. So that's a really interesting question because um, you know it touches uh, basically uh, res kind of resource management within the scope of uh, commitments, and you know I think that um, so basically this implementation is. Um, Kind of a synchronous uh, enforcement of commitment because we have that uh, the validity conditions are atomically enforced in whatever operation we're trying to make. So, it, for example, in the case of a kind of abstraction, um, we have that uh, there's a modifier that checks the commitments, and so that atomically enforces you know the execution of the user operation with the checking of the conditions. So um, I don't think there's a latency problem there, but. You know, there's a question of, uh, you know, I guess analogously, uh, uh, which is, um, you know, about like the gas usage of this, and you know, that's a re I would say, you know, with Barnabé, that's a question that we've discussed quite a bit, and I think obviously here you have that issue in which the person that defines the commitments uh, is not 
you know, the one that verifies them. And so the cost of verification is, you know, like um, bore by third parties. And, you know, you have this issue where like the person does perhaps not internalize the exter externality that they, they're generating. Uh, so one way is taxing. So for example, you can have that, um, you, like you tax, say you reduce from the balance uh, the gas used from the, uh, you know, from the validity checks of the commitments every time that you know, the network has to validate something. And so in that case, you have that the person would internalize, you know, Alice would internalize the cost. Or another option is to just set a fixed total cost and have it you know, be um, spread across all the commitments to check and all the complexity of them. Um, so uh, the, the second is the one that I went for in a prototype that I'm going to publish soon. So you know, hopefully that will become more clear. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you have these types of uh, proposer commitments, then the builders who are constructing the blocks need to construct blocks that satisfy those. And if the commitments are on like an individual proposer level, then like every single block, there's like new criteria for what you need to. Uh, uh, to build a block to satisfy. Yes. Um, and so have you thought about how this like changes the block building meta? Like it seems like yes. it makes the task of being a block builder significantly more difficult. Totally. I think that's a great point and one that I have personally not thought uh, much about. Um, I think you're going to have definitely uh, the case where builders simulate the, the block to see if it violates any commitments. But definitely, uh, oh, actually, so if you view commitments kind of, or you see block proposing as a constraint satisfaction problem, which is basically problems where you have a set of constraints and you're looking for some uh, assignment that full, you know, is, com is compatible with uh, constraints. The, um, the process of trying to find this data is called uh, basically um, you know, search, like constraint satisfaction problem uh, uh, search. And you know, there are like some um, algorithms from academia. So hopefully you know, uh, we can mirror uh, the dynamics of block proposing in terms of uh, constraint satisfaction problems, and that would make it uh, more clear for wi about which algorithms should builders run. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Could, could you have relays like have a list of commitments we have to? Yeah. So, so the, the implementation that I was thinking is um, you have a kind of a single ton smart contract, which is at an agreed upon address, and then anyone can uh, call a function in this contract that you know uh, with you know kind of retrieves all the commitments of uh, some, some users. So you can definitely have relays uh, use kind of uh, this registry. Um, yeah. OK, yeah. Um, given checking whether the commitment is consistent with previous commitments, a constraint satisfaction problem, perhaps we can ask Alice to propose a ZK proof in you know, every country. Yes, to make a commitment absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, Anoma, you know, they just published a work about uh, kind of framing intents in terms of constraint satisfaction problems, mm -hmm. and you know, they built infrastructure using Halo 2 to effectively create proofs for intents. Mm -hmm. So that basically uh, empirically confirms, I guess, uh, that idea. So yeah, you can definitely use proofs for this. Um, yes. Oh, okay, you. Uh, does does collision risk increase with the? Um, basically, the reward you replace. I mean, the transaction could replace this transaction. A contract transaction could replace some um, weak MVD transaction that could send reward reward back to the validator, right? And I guess that could cause collusion incentive for the validators. Um, okay. Correctly, right? Okay. And I'm, I'm just wondering if, like, the the payment for the one that's doing the contract depends on the basically the upscale value of the. Uh, wait, I'm, I'm curious about, okay, the connection between, uh, or like, okay, you have that, uh, there's a payment conditional, like a, a payment condition on, say, the transaction to be included, uh, and how that connects to, like, the collusion. Would you perhaps uh, explain me further? I mean, I guess you need to incentivize validator to not collude, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the more energy that's extracted, the more can be paid to the validator more you need to incentivize the validator not to collude. Okay. Otherwise, the validator could just say, oh, I'm going to pay you this yes. extra money because I'm going to get it anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's a good question. I, I don't know the answer, to be honest. Okay. Uh, I would need to think about it more. Yeah. Sorry, last question because we still have two speakers. <laughs> okay, cool. So if you have more questions, you can uh, come to Diego one by one. So then, let's ask the question. 
Final. Okay, <laughs> final question. Do you, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I was going to ask, okay, so uh, I, I was just curious, like I don't think this is solvable or anything, but uh, like how you think about this. Um, it seems like you could make commitments that are like really like detrimental to the network, like, you know, censor Uniswap or something, and then that affects like the next validators. So like, yeah. I'm curious how you think like how you think about that trade-off or how proposers Yeah, so uh, that's a really good point. And, you know, you see that those same issues coming, say, between, uh, say, in the case of, like, contracting between AI agents, where you can have, like, AI agents commit uh, to, like, doing, you know, really bad things. Um, and so I think that that's definitely possible. Uh, at the same time, I guess a counter argument is that validators will simply, you know, validators would probably have done it anyway out of protocol. So in this case, you know, it's just uh, making explicit something that had the incentives been right, they would have done anyways. So I guess, I guess a counterpoint to that would be that at the same time, this perhaps will reduce the costs of contracting uh, for even those detrimental cases. So in that case, it would effectively uh, make them have a greater utility. Um, so in, I guess, you know, I'm in no position perhaps to like, or rather, you know, perhaps it's a question of like, to what extent can we uh, constrain the way people co uh, contract? And to be honest, I think that maybe, you know, it's too hard of a problem. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, the, the case is to let them contract for anything, even for bad things, uh, just to preserve that, uh, that freedom to contract um, however they want. Um, yeah. Thank you. And we don't have a rest between Yuki and Diego because, like, Yuki has something to do in the evening. So let's welcome Yuki.